Hey, everybody, Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. And today we have a very special guest, and I've known this fellow for quite a few years. We've had a lot of fun together and just always love talking with him and learning from him. His name is Dave Canterbury. He is the founder and president of Pathfinder Survival the Pathfinder School. Dave, welcome. Hey, thanks, Tom. Good to be here, buddy. Oh, it's great to talk with you and see you. And and we're going to have some fun today. And we're going to learn a whole bunch about Dave and hopefully even a few things that uh, I haven't known in the past. And so let's dive right in. So the first thing is, Dave, tell us about yourself from the standpoint of of where were you born and raised, and 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 then we'll we'll kind of come forward from there on how you got so interested and became such a proficient expert in not only the outdoors but in survival. Okay, so pretty simple, humble beginning. I was born in Indiana, raised in Indiana. Uh, spent a lot of time in the outdoors when I was a kid. I my parents got divorced when I was really young, and so I kind of spent time between two different homes like kids do when their parents are divorced. And my, my real father, the one who is my partner in this business, he was kind of a, an adventure type an adrenaline type of guy. He was a diver and he flew hang gliders and stuff like that. So he was kind of the crazy adrenaline junkie outdoors guy. And then my stepfather was more of the woodsman type of guy. He was a guy who was out hunting mushrooms, hunting squirrels, hunting deer, taking me to the woods, teaching me how to trap, things like that when I was young. So I kind of had that best of both worlds growing up in the outdoors and kind of learned a lot about the outdoors between those two individuals and then my grandfather's as well. Awesome. So you take that information that you have from from your dad and your stepdad and you use some of that and and then you have an experience on a reptile farm. Tell us a little about that. Okay, so. You know, I was crazy about reptiles even when I was a kid. Um, I used to bring snakes in the house. I remember bringing a snake in the house and I had a garbage can. The thing got out in the house somewhere. And my mom never forgave me for that but because um, she never found it. I, I don't know where it went. But anyway, um, so I turned that passion into reality when I worked on a reptile farm down in Florida for a while and just taking care of everything from venomous reptiles to alligators to different types of non-venomous reptiles. And then I also kind of did some side work at that same time, going out and catching native reptiles to Florida and selling them to bigger companies that were selling into the pet trade, like wholesale companies that would sell into the pet trade. And so I spent a lot of time in the, in the swamps of Florida, in the water, around the water, catching these reptiles and things like that every night with spotlights and buckets and pillowcases and up to my neck in water and stepping on snapping turtles and tripping over alligators and everything else to get to these reptiles, to catch them, to make money. And that was basically what I did to make money was, you know, buy reptiles, sell reptiles and take care of this reptile farm is what I did to make money for, I don't know, three or four years. So it got me a lot more experience with Southern climates and swampy areas and things like that in the outdoors. So that led to my furthering my outdoor experience, and outdoor uh, knowledge as well. So, and, and then you went uh, into uh, the trade of commercial fishermen and a diver also down south in Florida. I actually did that at the same time. What, what happened, it's kind of a weird situation because what happened was there was a guy who was actually became my mentor in the fishing industry. Uh, I'm not even sure if he's alive anymore or not, but because commercial, fishermen's been, commercial fishing has been outlawed in Florida now within so many miles of shore. Uh, because of sport fishing and things like that. But however, the guy that I'm talking about used to sell me turtles. He would catch turtles in his nets in the brackish waters off the coast of like Pine Island, places like that when he was mullet fishing. And he would bring those turtles to me, not sea turtles, not sea turtles, but they were called, uh, ah, crap. They were, they were a spotted type turtle. I can't remember the name of them now off the top of my head. But he'd bring those to me and he would sell them to me. And then he also did some stuff around freshwater catfishing and things like that he would bring me other types of turtles as well that he caught and i would buy those turtles and one day he was in my he was in the venomous room where i also used for storage and things like that and he saw my dive tanks in there and he said oh are you a diver i said yeah and he said well i got an idea for you how you could really make some big money and i said really how's that 
He said, well, I could use a first mate on my boat because I get tired of shucking fish all day. So I could use somebody to do some work for me part time if you want to do that. And he said a lot of times he said some of the best inland fishing for snapper and grouper and things like that are around shallow wrecks. And he said, you don't want to put your net around a wreck because when you're pulling net in or if the tide drifts the net, it'll hang up on the wreck. It'll tear your nets up. But he said, if I could get a diver to where I could just drop a net around this wreck, a diver go down in the water and shoot the side of the wreck with a powerhead, which was basically a, a 223 bullet that was loaded into the front of a spear gun. And you just shot it. And when it impacted, it set off the shell. And that explosion under the water would scare all the fish off the wreck into the net except the sharks they didn't scare <laughs> they would always stay right around the wreck so you were stuck with those guys in the net but so you would blow all these fish into the net and then some of the bigger fish the grouper and things like that they wouldn't swim out of the pipes and things that were underwater where they'd set up artificial reefs they wouldn't get out of that they'd just hang out in the pipes and if i could shoot them in the head with a spear gun not a power edge just a regular spear gun then I could sell them to the fish house and they would buy them as long as they were only shot in the head. And some of those grouper work like $5 a pound that I'm shooting 20 pound grouper, two, three, four a day. Right. And then we're getting, you know, $5, $6 for every moment that we bring in a Scott row in it during row season. And there were a lot of days. I mean, I was, I had two Harley Davises and a freaking IROC Z back then. And <laughs> then also the commercial, the commercial fishing industry went pow, down the train. And so at that point in time, that's when I kind of quit everything and moved up north back to Indiana. Okay, so you you were making some good money back in the day doing things that yeah most of us are like, really? Is that how we do that? That's pretty yeah, cool. It was, some, it was some fun times. It really was. So moving forward, you you created your survival themed and structural instructional videos on YouTube. And that's when I know I met you is when the YouTubes are really taking off. What drove you to, to go that route and start teaching survival tactics? You know, that was kind of a funny happenstance. I mean, everything kind of, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And, you know, God kind of guides your experience in life and what you're meant to do. But um, I actually did 18th century reenacting for quite a few years where you'd go out in, you know, brain tan skin clothing and a hunting shirt and a musket. And you would go out to places like the Daniel Boone National Forest and live off the land for three, four, five days. They called it historical trekking. And I would do that. And I did, did that for quite a few years. And that led me into that, you know, wilderness living, wilderness survival type stuff, really, really heavy, as well as some primitive skills. And when I was working in primitive archery i was doing a lot of stuff with primitive archery i kind of my focus kind of shifted into being interested in primitive archery and i wanted to learn how to start flint napping and things like that and i was flint napping one day in my kitchen believe it or not iris didn't like that very well but i had a big tarp on the floor and a kitchen chair and i was napping flint in the kitchen and and my brother-in-law came over and he's like man you should really put that kind of stuff on youtube and i'm this is back in 2007 eight time frame when youtube was brand new and mm -hmm. Facebook was brand new and people were like, and he was like, man, people would really dig that on YouTube. And I'm like, I don't even know what YouTube is. So I started checking into it and I put a couple of videos up on YouTube and I started getting a lot of questions about how do you do this? How do you do that? And so I started making more videos and more videos and more videos. And one thing led to another, you know, and I kind of started a business of selling some of the stuff that I was using that people wanted that they couldn't find. And that kind of led to me starting my own business and it grew exponentially from there to where that's all I was doing. I ended up, you know, I was, I was an automotive engineer for many years and I quit my full-time job because I was kind of like, I would go to work for 12 hours a day. I actually, at that point was driving a, an old, I think it was a 1978 or 79 CJ with no top on it. And I drove that thing to work, even in the winter time, an hour and a half, one way in Ohio with a big snowsuit on and a mask and gloves, Arctic mittens. And I drove that thing to work and back every day, even in the wintertime. And I kind of got to the point where I was like, you know, Iris, one thing's got to go either this or I got to quit making YouTube videos and shipping stuff online because I can't do both. It's too much. And she's like, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, this is what I want to do. And she said, well, it's not making that much money right now. I said, yeah, I know. And I had a really good job with benefits and everything and health insurance and She's like, well, you know, I'll support you, whatever you want to do. So I'm like, well, guess what? I'm kicking the job to the curb. Then and I'm going to do this. And here we are. 
right? So now the business is worth multi-millions of dollars and it's great. See, you really chased, entrepreneur chased your passion and said, listen, I'm pushing all chips in and hoping for the best, preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. And we're just going to work work through it every day and, and work hard. And and I know you did because I that's when I got to know you was in like 2007, 2008, somewhere in there when, when you were making all these YouTubes and, and, and you were just growing very rapidly in the 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 whole YouTube market and and I re, and I forget the numbers. I don't know if you remember, but how many YouTube views that you had had at one time? I mean, it was off the charts. Yeah, I don't even remember. It's it's in the obviously in the you know millions and millions now, um, but yeah, you know, it's like over a hundred million now. I'm pretty sure, but it's um, you know you were my first, the very first guy who ever actually kind of believed in me and said I'm going to send you product to work with and do reviews on YouTube because that was a new thing back then. People, you know, reviewing gear and talking about gear on YouTube was a new thing at that point in time because YouTube was new. So there wasn't very many gear reviewers around, especially in the survival industry. And you were like one of my, you know, one of my mentors at that time, one of my steps to becoming where I'm at today because you were the first guy that believed in me. Well, I, I, you know, I think you believed in yourself, Dave, and and I think a lot of us believed in you. We just a lot of people didn't know know you, and you and I were were very lucky to meet. And and I was like, this guy really knows what he's talking about. We obviously make outdoor bags, and so it was a great fit. And 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 you and I hit it off. So it was it was, uh, it was pretty easy on on our part. And I I do remember you did call one day. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make us laugh a little bit. And, uh, oh, my goodness, I can't remember the name of your goat. But we made you a set of goat panniers. Tanner, yeah. Tanner, the goat, that's right. And and one of the things you said in a video, you said, hey, these bags work really well. He said, I get my goat to do all the heavy hauling for me in when I'm going camping. And if things get really bad, I have a ready-made MRE right here. Oh, that was pretty good. But I know you've brought to us as well a lot of great ideas for for our bags, especially our rugged outdoor bags um, on, hey, some possibilities of if you did this or if you did that, that that could be a, a bag that people in this industry, specifically in the survival industry and uh, with the Pathfinder School uh, would really enjoy, you know, a bag like this. So you also, at right after that, you started writing books, survival books. Tell us a little bit about how you become an author. Obviously, you had the knowledge, Dave. That's that's a given, and anyone around can can look out there and and and, and Google up Dave Canterbury, and and you're going to see all kinds of great stuff. Uh, tell us about writing that first book because you've written several. Writing that first book and how you got into doing that. You know. It was, again, it was, I guess, right place, right time type of thing. Um, they, uh, the publisher, Simon & Schuster, called me out of the blue, um, Adams Media, and they said, you know, hey, would you like to write a book for us about survival? And I was like, well, yeah, but I've never written anything before. They were like, well, we'll you write the book, and we'll hook you up with a person that can make it the way it's supposed to be as far as the formatting goes, you know, what illustrations you want in there. They'll correct the wording and the phrasing if you want them to, and they'll make it exactly like it's supposed to be for the publishing. We just need you to write it. We need your knowledge to write it. And I said, okay. And so I wrote that first book, Bushcraft 101. And it wasn't the first book I'd ever written because I wrote a book that was self-published before that called Survivability of the Common Man. And we self-published that book. And we only ordered 2,000 copies of it on the first run. And we sold those. And then we did another run. I want to say it was 2,000 copies on a waterproof version. And we sold those. And those are really kind of collector's items now. They're on eBay, sometimes for stupid money. But And then once in a while, I'll be at a show or something. The guy will bring me like five copies, brand new. And he'll be like, <laughs> hey, I want you to sign this for me. I'm like, where did you get these things? Oh, I've been hoarding these things for years. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'll sign them, especially overseas, where that happens a lot overseas. Um, in the UK, especially, but so that I may, I don't know if they saw that book. They never really told me if they'd seen that book somewhere or not, but they asked me to write the book and I wrote it and it was a big success for them. And so, um, 
they just one book led to another and to another. And actually I have another one that's being published around father's day. It's going to come out in 2022. And I'm already working on another one with my instructor, Sean Kelly on nothing but shelter building. That's going to be a book very similar to what Daniel Baird wrote back in the forties. What I think it was called shelter shanties and something else like that. But that's the only book that's really been released over the last, you know, 60 years like that. So we're going to put one together. that's a little bit different. That's more modernized with the same theme in mind. And it's going to be a bushcraft shelter. Book. I think your seventh book. I was going to say, I was going to ask you to tell me a little bit about each book, but you kind of just walked through that there, which is, which is, is awesome. So if you could recommend to anybody who's, who's looking to get into bushcrafting and we look at your, all of the books that you wrote, if somebody's brand new to it and they want to get started, what, which one of your books, Dave, would you recommend somebody gets? I would say they start off with Bushcraft 101. That's a two-time New York Times bestseller. It's sold over a million copies now. And I would say that that's probably the book that has the idealism of how I really feel about what you should know and what you should think about and the mentality you should have, you know, in the short term and the medium term for survival in the wilderness. So you have... One book right now that's it's looking like it's going to come out near Father's Day of 22, and then you're starting to work on the next one at this point. Okay, Correct. perfect. I just wanted to make sure I, I understood and heard you. So let's now talk about, so you, you become an author, and that's really successful, and now the Pathfinder School, and you're actually wearing one of your t-shirts right now because we're doing this over Zoom. And let's talk a little bit about that Pathfinder School in Southeast Ohio. T tell us when you first started that, Dave, on, on what is the concept of it? What are you trying to teach? So I had enough people asking me on videos, in comment section, things like that. Do you teach one-on-one? -on -one? Can we learn from you in person? That in about 2009, I think it was, I started the Pathfinder School. And it was meant to be, in the beginning, just, you know, a, a three-day class of some sort that would teach people the basics of emergency survival and preparedness if they were going recreating in the wild. What should you have with you all the time and how to use it if you get into an emergency scenario? That's what it was meant to be. And then it kind of bloomed from there to a lot of classes and a lot of students and a lot of, a lot of work now. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of my passions for sure. So a few years back, in fact, quite a few years back, uh, I was not, you invited Duluth Pack to come to one of your Pathfinder schools, and I was not able to come, and our sales manager, Ryan, was able to come. So he came down to the Pathfinder, why are you laughing, Dave? So tell us the story, Ryan comes down, I know you treated him really well, and this is uh, learning survival in the outdoors, which Ryan is a big outdoors guy and does a lot of camping. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, so, you know, I met Ryan at the gathering the year before that, and, and I was quite impressed with him, he was a good guy. And like you said, he's got a lot of outdoor experience, does a lot of camping, so he shows up to school. I'm thinking, okay, this guy's going to, you know, fit in with the crowd. He's going to be a little bit ahead of the game, maybe ahead of the learning curve. And the first thing he tells me is, you know, it's like, hey, uh, I got a hotel registered for tonight. Is it okay to go there instead of camping? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking, are you kidding me, man? I, <laughs> you hang out with Tom, right? I mean, Tom's like this, this hardcore winter camping guy, and you don't want to camp? <laughs> But I mean, it was okay with me. It was fine. It's just a good ribbing point for him because he is such a camper. Um, but he did well at school. He did fine. So I, I'm happy with that. So it's funny because Dave and I, just so everyone knows, give Ryan a lot of hard time about that because it was part of it was he didn't realize he was supposed to be camping out at it. He thought everyone went to the school during the day, got a hotel and then came back the next day. And so he was not prepared to, to camp out at the school. And, and we, uh, we still rib him many years later about that. If you go into a survival school, you should probably be ready to, to hang out outside. But Dave, I will say, I will say, you are still invited to come up here in the winter and go winter camping with me in the deep snow and the real cold. I'm gonna tell you, when it comes to snow, I, I, that's not my, that's not my favorite environment. I can promise you that. Yeah, um, we've been trying for years. <laughs> that, that's, um, yeah. 
that's not my favorite environment. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I make no bones about it. I would much rather be in a swamp any day of the week, be oh, surrounded goodness. by mosquitoes and hundred degree weather, than well, be in snow three feet deep. I'm going to keep trying, and, and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen someday. So we'll let's let's talk about because in every class that you give and every presentation I see you give when we're at trade shows, because we end up seeing each other at a lot of trade shows, you talk about the five C's, as in Charlie, of survivability. Can you please walk us through all of that and, and, and why you came up with that acronym? Okay. Um, so early on when I developed the Pathfinder School, I was looking for I've always been a big believer in kind of keeping things as simplistic as you can to understand and as simplistic as you can to learn. And I think my engineering background kind of leads me down that path of what is the most important input variable that you can put into a process and how can you eliminate variation within those inputs to get the same output every single time. And if you can simplify things as best you can, it makes it very easy for people to learn. And so one of the things that I started researching early on was what types of items did people tend to carry from as early as I could trace back some kind of written or proof in documentation up to, you know, even the frontier pioneer era. What did people carry with them all the time to affect their day-to-day -day survival? And then when I started looking through that and gathering my notes and pages and pages of notes and things like that, it came down to really five different types or categories of items. And I was able to squeeze them into a category that starts with C so that I could use it as a C acronym or the five C's to help people understand that easier. So it became cutting tools, combustion devices, cover elements to protect you from the outside, containers to be able to cook food, make medicine and disinfect water, and then cordage to be able to tie, lash, and bind. And if you, if you really wanted to say, well, how far back does that concept go? You could look all the way back to Otsi the Iceman. I'm sure you're familiar with Otsi, who was a mummified hunter-gatherer from about 3,500 years ago, discovered by hikers in the Alps on the border of Italy and Austria. And he was basically died there and mummified in the ice and everything that he had with him was mummified with him as well. So you have a guy who was in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, he was traveling from one point to another. And so everything that he had is what he would have considered, this is essential for my survival. And he had two cutting tools. He had an ax and he had a, a flint knife. He had clothing on his back or cover elements that would protect him, including furs and including a grass shawl that he could wrap around him or he could open up in front of a fire to trap convective heat. He had a fur hat and things like that. And he had three layers on his feet before layers were cool. Before layering was the thing, they already knew that. 3,500 years ago, he had reindeer moss with skin and a grass netting over the top of that to hold those layers together. So he had a three layer footwear system before anybody even documented that kind of stuff. Then he also had combustion devices with him in the fact that he had flint, he had iron pyrite, and he also had um, tinder fungus from the birch tree. So he had a way to effectively make fire. The containers that he had at that point were not the same as the containers we have today, obviously, because he didn't have the material. But he did have a birch bark container that was put together, was sewn together with some type of a rawhide lace, and it was sealed with birch tar. So it was a container that would hold water, would hold something that he was cooking, and he could stone boil in that container if he wanted to make the water hot. And then he had a backpack, which I would also consider a container, that he could carry his worldly possessions inside of as well. And then for cordage, he had things like rawhide. He had plant material that was woven together. And he also had a belt pouch that was made from leather that had a stone disc on it that had several different types of cordage hanging from that stone disc that he could have used to replace cordage like sinew, rawhide, plant materials and things like that that he could use to repair his gear with over time. So he had all five of those type items with him. And the only thing he had besides that was a bow and some arrows. So that tells you that even 3,500 years ago, those five items were the most critical items to him. 
Now, when you think about that from a survival standpoint, even in the modern day, if you think about those five items and what it takes to create them from the landscape, you have to find something to make a blade with. Even if you could find nappable stone or a piece of glass, it's not going to last very long. If you can find the material to make a bow drill fire, that's good. You know, you're going to have to build a shelter out of natural material, tie a lash and bind that shelter with cordage you make off the landscape. If you make a bow drill fire, that cordage has to be strong enough to support a bow drill fire and a spindle, which is very difficult. So you have to have specialized materials and you have to have knowledge and you have to have those resources available to you to be able to recreate them. So those five items were important to carry because you don't want to have to try to recreate those off the landscape because all of them directly affect really the main survival priority, which is don't let yourself get too hot and don't let yourself get too cold. That's really your main survival priority beyond first aid or self-aid, making sure you're not bleeding out and have broken bones and you can breathe. Your main priority is to maintain that body core temperature. And so fire, shelter, being able to hydrate yourself, all of those things are what control that. And having the tools to be able to do that is what counts. And if you go forward, even into the frontier era, you know, those guys, I practiced that myself. So I know what those guys carry. I had to have documented gear, you know, that showed, hey, somebody had a document somewhere, a journal entry or a diary that they were carrying this type stuff back in that time period. And so, you know, I had a belt knife, a jack knife, and a tomahawk or a hatchet. I had the clothing on my back was generally some type of linen shirt and some kind of buckskin leggings and then a breech clout made from wool and then some kind of leather moccasin with a lining inside of it made of linen or wool. And then, you know, for combustion devices, I had flint and steel. I had a magnifying glass that you would have used to light a pipe with or a lighter or some type of tobacco, but you could also use that to light tinder with. And then you had the flintlock mechanism on your musket or your rifle for that as well. For containers, they had, you know, copper, brass, tin that was lined. They had even cast iron a little later in the period. And if you look at things like containers and how important those really are in the modern day, Lewis and Clark when they came back from their epic journey that they made and they took hundreds and hundreds of pieces of trade gear with them to trade for passage to any country along the way, the only thing that they returned with were their metal pots and their muskets. So that tells you how important those metal pots were to their everyday survival, because it was the only thing they weren't willing to trade away. And then, you know, on top of that, the frontier people carried oil cloth tarps. They carried canvas tarps. They carried wool blankets to keep themselves warm. So they carried those five, same five types of items. And the only thing they carried above and beyond that, if they were walking and on a horseback or wagon, was generally their musket and the accoutrements it took to fire and clean that musket. So they even had those same five categories of items with them all the time. So Dave, you talk about, so let's say we go to, I come and sign up for one of your, your courses at the Pathfinder School. Uh, and, and I'm assuming that we are not only going to learn from you the five C's, but now we're going to implement them in the outdoors using the five C's for survivability. Yeah. And the idea of that is, goes back to one of the basic mentalities at the Pathfinder School was multifunction of every item. If you don't, you put an item in your backpack and it can't do multiple things for you, especially things that will directly affect your ability to survive, then you probably shouldn't be carrying that item. And those five C's are all multifunctional in nature. So at the school, what we teach people is you've got this one single stainless steel water bottle and nesting cup. What can I do with that? That's a good example of, of one of the things that you have. So you can boil water to disinfect it off the landscape. You can use it for a hot water bottle or a cold pack for first aid. You can use it for an irrigation device as first aid. You can empty it out and use it for a noise making or echoing device the signal for rescue. You can make charred material off out of it by putting the cup over the top, putting in the fire to create a chamber to create charred material for next fire, for your next fire mentality, because then you have something that takes a very small spark to ignite that instead of raking sparks off of your ignition device like a ferro cerium rod or over and over again with your lighter. All it takes is a single spark from your lighter to light that charred material. So we teach them multiple ways to use those five items to directly affect their survival and how, how functional they really are. 
in, in your schools, I know in discussions I've had with you in the past, some of your very early students now have become experts in the field and have become some of your instructors as well. Absolutely. And a lot of them have started their own schools as well. Okay. So what is Dave Canterbury's? You're an outdoor guy. And, and, and if you look at videos, folks, uh, y- you got to go see some of these videos because when Dave lives what he talks about. So he practices what he preaches. And there's a lot of videos out there where Dave literally takes his five C's and he heads out in the bush and he's self-filming himself. And you can see Dave utilizing these, these five C's in, the, in, in survival for several days while he's out in the bush. And I know a few years ago, you, you on purpose went and lived in a yurt for a long time into some very cold weather. And you were doing a lot of videos at that time. And you and I had some discussions around those as well. That was when I discovered I wasn't a big fan of cold weather. <laughs> a way to cold weather. Come on, you were in southern Ohio, right? That's south of the Mason Dixon line. So, what is knowing all this? What is Dave Canterbury's favorite outdoor activity? Oh, man. Oh, man. That's a difficult huh? one. Really. We're putting you on the spot here, Dave. Yeah, you are. You know, I think probably my favorite outdoor activity would just be to walk through the woods. I, I mean, I like to just walk through the woods and see what I can see. What animals can I see? What plants can I see? Which ones can I identify on site? What trees can I see to identify them? You know, can I find a reptile around somewhere? Uh, I like to go up to water and look at water source and see what animals are living in the water. I like to hunt mushrooms. So, I mean, anything I can do that gets me outdoors in the woods and just identifying and looking at things, that's what I really enjoy the most. And then there's a lot of things I do peripherally around that, obviously, but that's what I really enjoy. So in all of that, with all the time you've spent in the outdoors, have you ever come across a life or death death situation with an animal or a situation, Dave? You know, I guess a lot of times I think that depends on what you mean by life and death. I mean, um, I, I think some people's life and death is somebody else's not life and death, I guess is the way to put it. You know, I mean, I have during filming, I have come across actual cobras in the wild and instead of you know being afraid for my life i just caught the thing but and i think somebody else might consider that life and death at the same time you know i've been really really cold before (laughs) i've been really really not wanting to be where i'm at before and thought you know if i can't keep this fire going till morning i'm probably not gonna not gonna get through the night and then i've you know probably one of the worst situations that i was ever in was actually when i was a commercial fisherman Uh, we we're actually out fishing in a, an area off of the coast of Florida. And it was during mullet row season and we were in some really shallow water and the boat broke down in a, in a very remote area that we were in doing mullet fishing. And we got stuck there for three days with really nothing to eat except for what we had in the boat and no way to cook what we did have in the boat um, and no gas. So we just kind of got stuck there through the rain and, and it does get cold. Believe it or not in Florida, Tom, it does get cold. <laughs> I can tell you that from personal experience, it gets cold in Florida, but I think that's probably the worst experience I've ever had personally was, was those three days. Um, and, and just hoping that the boat was going to come by and be able to tow us in to get fixed. But other than that, I mean, I really think that survival is a subjective thing. I tell one of the things I tell my students at the Pathfinder school very early on in class is I want you to understand and get it in your head that 99% of things that people talk about on the internet, as survival situations are really inconvenient camping. And when you get that in your brain, then it's a lot easier to cope with things because it's not a, I got lost on a trail and I can't walk out till tomorrow or I can't find my way out till tomorrow or I ran out of gas on a logging road. And I got to walk 10 miles out and it's getting dark. That's not survival. That's inconvenient camping. I don't really want to be here, but I can do it. That's, and I have that's, some skill sets now to make it through this. Right. So in this school, Dave, do you teach about mindset? If you get into a situation like that where, hey, I'm lost, I'm going to have to hunker down here, it's cold, it's night, I'm scared, on how to keep your wits? You know, I think you, the the way we do that, Tom, it's a little, the way I do that is a little bit unorthodox, I, I think, and people don't really understand that I'm doing it until after it's being done, but I don't, you can't tell somebody that you can't I can tell you whatever I want to tell you about how you're going to react 
in an emergency scenario, but I have no idea how you're going to react personally. And you probably don't either, unless you've been through an emergency scenario. But if I, if I put you in a position where you have to start a fire, build a shelter and boil water, and it's a timed event, you have to do it within a certain amount of time. And I made you walk two miles through a navigation course right before that and collect all the material that you needed to be able to do A, B, C, D, E, and F when you got back. And now you haven't had any food all day today because I didn't let you eat. And you've had all the water you want, but you were probably too busy thinking about other things to drink. So you're partially dehydrated. Now your mind is working the same as it would be in an emergency scenario, because now you're not thinking clearly. You're a little bit confused. You have a lot of tasks you have to do at one time and you have to process all that information under duress. And that's really the learning curve at the Pathfinder School on the final day is that's where you learn yourself. And knowledge of self is something that I can't teach you, but I can put you in that position without letting you go over the top. And so that's what we try to do at the Pathfinder School. So it, it really comes down to almost like muscle memory. If you're an athlete, you get into muscle memory training and, and it becomes rote for you, if I will, if you will, um, that, that you've trained yourself. So it just becomes natural or, or like I say, muscle memory it might be the brain muscle helping you out there. And, and, it's, and it's not just a brain muscle. It's muscle memory in general, like you said. I mean, it's no different than guys who shoot handguns for a living or, or anything like that. It's, it is a matter of I've tied this knot so many times I can do it in the dark. I can do it with one hand. I can do it, you know, doesn't really matter. I'm going to be able to tie this knot. I don't have to think about that anymore. I can put this shelter up in five minutes because I have my kit prepared. I've done it a few dozen times now, and it's committed to memory. And it doesn't matter if I've got a headlight and it's dark or if I've only got one hand. I'm going to be able to do this. And that easing of your mind in a, in a survival scenario changes your entire outlook on being stressed out because you're no longer stressed out. Now I can worry about things that are realistic and not things that are unrealistic because the difference between putting a shelter up in five minutes and a half an hour may not be the difference between life and death, but you might think it is. And if you can put that shelter up in five or 10 minutes, it's no longer an issue. It doesn't play on your mind anymore. Perfect. So this is one question that some people here at the company had. Years ago, you were on a reality TV show, and there's a lot of them out there on bushcrafting and survivability. Right now, there's two of them that a lot of people watch. First of all, do you watch any of them? I do not. Okay. Because there's two of them that people really like out there. One's called Alone, which I think you would Unless it was up uh, in the winter, you wouldn't do very good because you're self-professed, but, but uh, that you would. But there's two of them, one called Alone and one called Naked and Afraid. And I was always afraid to ask the question because I was like, no, please, Dave, please do not go on Naked and Afraid because I won't watch it. Yeah, we could just say that because, because I know you so well and, and love you so much. So what would you give at, as advice, Dave, to somebody who's looking for a career in outdoor recreation or in the outdoor realm? Well, it wouldn't be to go on television probably, but um, I mean, I've watched both of those shows. I've trained some of the people that are on those shows. Um, I've trained several people that have been on both of those shows, to be honest with you, after school. Um, and, and they're not bad, but people have to understand that television is not reality. It's called reality television, but it's only reality because you're sitting there watching it. It's not necessarily reality. There's a lot of things you don't see, a lot of things you don't hear, and a lot of things that are done that you don't know about. But that's beside the point. So if someone wants to start a career in the outdoors, you know, and it's a difficult thing because I have people messaging me all the time about that, Tom, and they say, you know, what do I have to do to become a survival instructor? What do I have to do to make a living at survival? What do I have to do to do what you're doing? And honest to goodness, you know, now is probably not the best time to try to do that. And I'm not trying to drive away competition by saying that. Because I think competition is a healthy thing. Um, I'm more than happy to send people to other schools. It doesn't bother me a bit. What I think is that the time that we live in now, when, when you and I first met and YouTube was young and Facebook was young and there was, you know, 10 survival channels on YouTube, it was much easier to get people to know who you were, to follow you, to be ingrained in, you know, this is a guy that I want to learn from. Then when you have, you know, 14,000 YouTube channels to choose from that are about survival and bushcraft, it's an entirely different ballgame now. And 
the one thing that I, that I think people struggle with that they don't understand is no one, there's not a whole lot of people in this industry that actually make a good living doing what I do. There's not. And that's not bragging. That's just the way it is. And I think the reason for that is, is that you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. I could not make a living just teaching survival courses, but I have a store. I have books that I've written. I do personal appearances. I do classes overseas. I have sponsorships from companies that pay me a yearly salary. So I have multiple revenue streams that come in every month that support my living. If I just had to make a living of one thing and somebody said, how do I make a living being a survival instructor? I would say, good luck, unless you like eating a lot of baked beans and cornbread. Okay. That's fair. So, you know, I mean, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of what it's like to be an entrepreneur. I mean, and that's not to say that you couldn't make a, a decent living if you were living alone, you were by yourself, you didn't have a family to raise, you didn't have a lot of debt. You didn't mind driving an old car and living in a trailer or something like that. You couldn't get 20 students a month and make a decent amount of money. But again, you know, it's, 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 everything's about perception. What's your perception of a decent amount of money? If sure. $40,000 a year is decent money to you, you might be able to do that by yourself, just teaching survival classes. If you have to have six figures or better, you better find another revenue stream to go along with that. Sure. So you, you're going to have to be an entrepreneur like like yourself, where you have that coming in. So how have you gone about, Dave? Obviously, the YouTube channel kicked it all off, but you are very networked in the outdoor industry. Um, I see that. I know that uh, from trade shows and and you know your appearances at trade shows and the the, the speeches you give and the booths that you know, people ask you to be in and then people flood into the booth to you know get pictures with you and talk to you and and uh, and you sign autographs. How, how would you say how, how people could go about networking the best today and how do you make that successful? You know, I still I still beat the bushes. You know, there's no question about that. I, I do have a lot of people that come to me. Unfortunately, when you get to the point that I'm at with the following that I have, a lot of people come to you that you really aren't interested in. I mean, I get emails every single day from companies everywhere saying, will you review this product? We'd be happy to give you this for a review on YouTube. And it's like, if I would never carry that thing to begin with, why would I want to review it and tell people to go buy it? So you have to be selective with that. But what you shouldn't be afraid to do is, because I still do it to this day, like I said, is you shouldn't be afraid to beat the bushes. If there's somebody out there, I mean, where would I be if I'd never called you? You know, that's a question I ask myself all the time. If I had been afraid to make that first contact with a company that was out of my realm and out of my reach and say, hey, listen, man, I want to make a video and use your product and talk about it. And I'd really like to, I can't afford to buy it, but I'd really like to use it. If you don't try, you're never going to succeed. So you got to keep beating the bushes all the time. And then you've got to watch what's trending and what's, you know, what social media platforms are the best to be able to get yourself out on and for people to start following you. Because really, it takes a big following of people now to make you successful, especially in this day and age. It's getting worse and worse. You know, 10 years ago, if you had 20,000 subscribers on YouTube, that was a big deal. Now, if you don't have 100,000, YouTube won't even hardly look at you. They won't even hardly put advertising on your video if you don't meet certain criteria. You know, you have to have so much watch time per month and make so many videos and have so much, how many, so many views per month. Otherwise, they won't even partner with you anymore and give you advertising on your channel. So all of that filters down. It's the same thing with Instagram. You know, if you approach a company on Instagram and ask them to, to pay you to use their product or give you product to be to review the first thing you're going to do is go to your channel and they're going to say how many followers this guy have and that's where the power comes in with with social media is the following that you have so until you can create that it's a double-edged sword because it's hard to create a following without making content it's hard to make content without having something to make content about so it's kind of a double-edged sword and you've got to just keep beating the bushes and keep beating the bushes and keep i mean even to this day I get up at seven o'clock pretty much every single morning and I don't go to bed until, you know, 10, 11 midnight. And I usually don't sit down on the couch at my wife until like nine 30 and I'm on the computer on social media or out in the woods and getting content every day, seven days a week, 
99% of the time to this day. I know that because I'll be I'll be sitting on a Sunday evening and my phone will ring and it'll say Dave Canterbury and I'll pick it up and you go, hey, Tom, I was out in the, the woods this weekend and I got an idea and which are really <laughs> fun phone calls. But I know that you have a very difficult time turning it off. So you're talking about social right now. Just so everyone out there, because we want to get more followers for you, give us your website, first of all. So my website is sufferlianceoutfitters.com, and that is my web-based business. Cool has a schedule of events. Selfrelianceoutfitters.com, and yep. give us your social handles. So Pathfinder Survival is both Instagram and TikTok. And Woodland Survival is my, or Dave Canterbury is my Facebook fan page. So and say then, those once more for everyone so they can make sure they get them. Okay. So Dave Canterbury is my Facebook fan page as well as my YouTube channel. Pathfinder Survival is my Instagram and my TikTok. Handle. Perfect. So Dave, uh, we see each other at a lot of trade shows. And a few years back, I remember you had people that, and you're so gracious to all of your followers and all your fans. And, and uh, one day, I think you were just, you were exhausted. The trade shows are exhausting. And I said, hey, let's get a bite to eat tonight. And you said, yeah, I need to get off the beaten path, Tom. I just need a little bit of, of alone time, you know, quiet time. And, and you know, what, what do you have in mind? Because I, I, don't, I don't really want to go downtown. I said, no, I got this great place and and nobody will recognize you dave we meet at this uh pizza place and it was it was off the beaten path it was like a it was like a an underground and i'm waiting for you and you come around the corner and you're waiting for a parking spot and four guys on motorcycles are pulling out and i just pointed to you to park there and before the guys even backed out of their spots i remember uh one of the guys puts up the shield on his helmet. He looks at the rest of the guys. He goes, hey, there's Dave Canterbury, the survival guy. <laughs> and you looked at me like, really, Tom? I thought we were going somewhere quiet. But what I'll tell people is, folks, Dave was so gracious uh, to these people because they were coming in and then people were phoning other people to come there. You talk about loyalty. And to me, loyalty is a big thing. And like I said in the, a little while ago, you know, you kind of gave me my first shot at things. And so I've always tried to remember that. And even, you know, I've developed my own products, even though I've worked with other companies, things like that. I always try to fall back to that Duluth brand. And when, when I have a chance to collaborate with you on something, you know, I'm going to jump at that chance every time. And the fact that, you know, you develop some Pathfinder products that are branded, that are Duluth made Pathfinder branded, you sell them on your website. We sell them on our website. You drop ship them for us. The connection with Spring Creek, um, on the buck saws and things like that. All of those relationships are very, very important to me. And they all boil down to that loyalty. You know, one thing that I, I try to instill in every one of my instructors and everyone who works for me is, you know, loyalty is one of the most important things in this industry. If somebody does you right, especially in the beginning of your career, you owe them for the rest of your career. And I just, I'm a big believer in Duluth Pack. I'm a big believer in your quality. I love your company. I love the way you you know, begged me to give you back a pack so you could fix it that I got mouse eaten and chewed up and I sewed it up my hand and you begged me to give it back to you so you could fix it. And I'm like, no, I like it just the way it is. But just the fact that, you know, you would do that for anybody, not just me, you know, you would do that for anybody. And I respect that. And that's one of the things that I've tried to take forward to my company is I try to guarantee everything I sell to the nth degree. If you run that thing over the combine, I'll give you another one. If, if that's what it takes to keep a loyal customer, I would rather do that than tell you to go pound sand and you go buy the next canteen or bush pot from somebody else. It's just not worth it at that point. You have to be loyal to your customers, loyal to your fans, and loyal to the people who have supported you all along, like you have, Tom. Hallelujah. And that's that's the way I, I wish people were as loyal to one another. And, and uh, as I always say, Dave, I said, you know what? Uh, if we could be half as loyal as our dogs are to us, boy, this would be a great world. We're going to get into this section here, Dave, that we call Packed Questions. Huh, pretty creative, isn't it? But oh, prior man. to that, I want to see behind your left elbow, and then we're going to, you can tell people, because Dave has a lot of tattoos, and uh, there it is. 
I can tell you, folks, what Dave is showing me right now is Dave <laughs> got the Duluth pack and his bride, Iris, wonderful lady, got on her calf the Duluth pack logo tattooed. I love my company. I love it to death. I don't have it tattooed on me, Dave. So God bless you on that. I appreciate it. You should have a tattooed on your forehead, Tom. Well, you know, sometimes I think people think I do, but uh, that, that's not working for me. So we're going to go on to this packed questions section. And this is just a little bit to dig into to you, Dave. Number one is, what is your favorite piece of outdoor equipment? The one piece you cannot do without. Man, I'd have to say a pocket knife. Okay. You know? Listeners, this is from an expert in the field, and he would not go without a pocket knife. Number two, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? Wow. <laughs> we can't say it on the air, Tom. <laughs> the best piece of advice I've ever had was guy told me, and he was a good friend of mine for a long, long time. I've known him probably almost as long as I've known you. His name is Tony Daniel. Told me one time, he said, if the world was right, there'd be a shortage of fishing poles. Amen. That. That's good for the soul. For sure. What is your biggest fear? My biggest fear? Um, honestly, it's probably to not be able to take care of my wife in our older years. It's, it's, you know, I always want to make sure that she has everything she ever needs. And so everything I do really is to that end goal. And in my last pack question I have for you, you have been very fortunate in the last several years to be able to travel all over the world and some really cool places that you've told me you've been and that you are getting ready to go to. What is your absolute favorite all of, out of all of them? That's an easy one. Australia. Why? Because I love the culture. I love the landscape. It's not cold. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just, I really enjoyed the people there. I really enjoyed the culture there and the landscape. I, I just really like Australia. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like, it's modern, but it's not modern in a lot of ways. And when you get out in the bush around bush type people, they 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 live like I think woodsmen are supposed to live. You know, they they live for the bush, and I like that. That's awesome. So, first of all, we thank you, Dave, for taking the time. We know that you're actually just getting ready to go to your granddaughter's soccer games. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this knowledge with our, our listeners. People, go follow Dave Canterbury, the Pathfinder School, um, and – Folks, this has been Dave Canterbury, New York Times bestseller, owner of the Pathfinder School. And until next time, unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors. The outdoors. The outdoors. The outdoors. The outdoors. The outdoors.